Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we're going to look at the three regional championships which kicked off the Unbroken Bonds format. I think we had some really interesting results from these tournaments. Um, Sydney being a smaller regional, but Santa Clara and Sao Paulo, almost 500 players uh, for both. So, I mean, they're really valid data to start looking into how the Unbroken Bonds metagame is going to start shaping up. And um, we'll also have a look at the end to see where the metagame is uh, sort of combining all three of those results towards the end. So we're on the lovely Limitless website to uh, sort us through this. Starting off with the largest event, Sao Paulo got to 501 Masters in Brazil. And it was taken down by Pablo, Tablemon himself, playing Reshiram and Charizard tag team. Definitely the most promising tag team that came out from the set. I don't think there's a surprise to start seeing this do very well. And Pablo was playing a Jirachi-based build. He also had a couple of Let Loose as well as Lele and a Dene. He played one copy of Volcanion as well as one copy of Turtonator for some non-GX attackers. The Mill Tank coming in to heal off damage when your Reshirams can tank hits. And everything else is very straightforward. He even posted in his own uh, Facebook post that he just went simplistic with the list as much as possible to try and maximize his odds of getting the likes of Turn 1 Welders, Kiaways. He filled out his deck with four Acrobikes as well for extra digging potential. So it really is a, as simple as it gets, really, for Reshizard. He played four copies of Kiawe, which is very, very high. Personally, I would like to see some um, uh, Mysterious Treasures added over a couple of these Kiaways. Um, I think by cutting two Kiawe for two Treasures, you give yourself higher Let Loose odds for turn one, which I prefer. Um, seeing as though Kiawe is dead mid-game, but... You gotta give him credit that, like, you know, you just want to hit Kiawe on one, and there's risks to adding in more treasures over physical Kiawe because uh, you force your own Lele onto the board sometimes. So you can see where he's coming from in this regard. He's got three Ultra, three Nest, three Fire Crystals uh, to recycle those energy cards. He plays no copies of um, the uh, Fiery Flint, so. Uh, the welders aren't always live, but I think Acrobike and Viridian Forest to help him dig. He shouldn't have too much trouble finding them for full value. And um, from there, he plays a couple ropes in addition to two switches to supply his uh, four Jirachi base build uh, alongside um, the escape boards as well. So pretty streamlined, simplistic list. I think this is definitely one that people will take note of and just pretty much uh, copy and paste for themselves. I can't see much I'd want to change outside of like maybe the Kiawe counts are kind of sketchy. Um, and only having fire crystals and no fiery flints is also a small surprise for me. Um, but I think we're very close to having a nailed on 60 for the Jirachi build of Reshizard. But we've seen all sorts of Reshizards be successful. In the finals, he took down a Zoro Persian that also played a 1 1 line of Slowking. Um, just a 1 1 line of Slowking is kind of scary. And you saw in the finals that Pablo literally was guzmering the ditto on like turn two and then knocking out like the slow king would come in and respond on the first reshizard and then pablo would respond on the slow king and then the zorak player just like i have nothing to do and then uh, pablo is like second reshizard just carried for the final few prize cards so that's something to take note of interesting that we're seeing the thicker persian line a lot of the japanese zora list played a 1-1 persian but this is a thicker line of persian getting you to get catwalking for guaranteed cards is obviously very good uh the Finalist list played a couple copies of Marshadow, which is a real surprise. I think Field Blow is going to be more and more relevant than this Marshadow. Um, obviously, having Red Knuckles as an option to get you through some like Boswells is a reason to play this card. But I found this really, really, really surprising that they play two Marshadow um, and still play a Field Blower, um, as well as one Stadium. I think two copies of Field Blower might start becoming more mandatory. Uh, we obviously saw the Shedinja control deck um, in America, which we'll talk about later. Um, and also, um, there's like batons being played in a lot of uh, lists like Baby Clowns and Quagnag. Uh, there's spell tags being played in Weezing. So this Marshadow, although strong and although is a nice tech card to Boswell, I feel like it's going to be overtaken by just a couple copies of Field Blower more often than not. Uh, the Muck is still in here. Mew was still played. Obviously a great card for helping you against uh, Pika Rom, which is one of your harder matchups now that you take out the... Uh, Fighting support. I think fighting support might still have to be an element of this archetype because we've seen some other Reshizards. Pablo's didn't play any uh, Eevee Snorlax tag team, but uh, there have been some successful lists that do play Eevee Snorlax. And 
when they are playing Eevee Snorlax, Slowking is useless, obviously, and they can just dominate Zoro players. So I think Eevee Snorlax will be creeping into Reshizards if Zoro is going to keep with just blue stuff. But I'm imagining that Zoro has to also incorporate some brown stuff. Maybe it's just a Marshadow Machamp tag team that gets added into their lists. That's what I'm more or less assuming is going to be the case. Uh, we saw the Oranguru added into the deck as well. Seven energies total. I don't mind this split at all. Four triple acceleration being the most important one for your Persian and Slow Kings to attack as well as Zorak when you need to. And then three DCEs. Uh, four Lily, three Guzma. Obviously, you're not playing, um, what's it called anymore? Lycan Rock, so you need the extra Guzma. Only one Ace of Rhoda is a little bit interesting. One Tain Liza to incorporate with the Monkey. Four, four, four on the Ball Search, I like. Uh, the Max Potion added over one of the Acer Rollers. I think that's partly because you can just Persian dig for it at the right times. So I think that's kind of the mentality there. Sky Pillar played in addition to Mew, which is quite interesting. Uh, again, helping you out against like, the likes of Weezing and helping you out against the likes of Picarom, um, which is pretty reasonable. Obviously, against Picarom, sometimes you want to get Muck out because they're going to be Jirachi based. Um, and this is a counter stadium at the very least. I'm not so sold on the Sky Pillar, but it's definitely a reasonable card. I think if you're trying to just tech for Weezing, you would just play um, the good old Champions Festival. Um, but Sky Pillar also has that added benefit of helping you out against uh, Pika Rom. So there's definitely some merit to Sky Pillar. We saw a couple more. Well, we actually saw four Zoroarks in the top eight of uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, so... The finalist playing Persian and 1-1 one, one Slow King. In top four, we saw a Zoro Persian Lycan Rock, so still some brown stuff. Patricia played um, Zoro Persian Slow King. I imagine that means it's a 2-2 Slow King line. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Not too much else is different. They're also playing the Sky Pillar. So I think this is literally just a couple cards different from the finalist list. So definitely a good starting point if you're looking towards that. Um, then we have Alex Silva um, playing Zapdos. Alex Silva did very well at the EUIC, remember? A very talented player. Um, then we see Bastion Silva with Zor uh, Reshizard with Volk. We haven't seen his list yet, um, but obviously we've seen the Volk Greens build do well in Santa Clara. Gustavo, obviously another name who did very well at the EUIC. Uh, um, he ended up winning, of course, uh, with Zoro Silvalli Dugong. I I'm really excited to see that list. Um, I'm not sure what he sort of plays with the Sylvalli. Uh, potentially it might be like some fighting memory or something like that. Maybe even some water memories in there as well. But not playing Persian, instead playing Sylvalli is an interesting twist. And we see our first Weezing um, in the top eight here. The Weezing is playing a Jirachi-based build of Weezing, which is very surprising. Um, normally you just see Let Loose Monkey and like Pokegears to help you consistency-wise. Um, this is playing the Lavatar and Frost Rotom Tex. Interestingly, very, very interestingly, it doesn't play any um, Fairy Transfer or Psychic Transfer Tapu Lele, the non-GX. That's a huge surprise to not see in a Weezing list. Uh, the Frost Rotom has sort of popped up to try and be an answer to Reshizard. I actually don't like Frost Rotom at all, really. I would prefer it to be Mimikyu, because unless they're using Double Blaze, which happens once, uh, you can use um, Copycat against Reshizards and have a much better time, so... I actually don't really think this is a good enough tech card. I think you're better off just playing Mimikyu because you still are countering you required. You do more damage than Frost Crush does against the Reshizard. Um, and you also have Filch, which can draw you more cards. So I think this is a tech card which is currently in, but I think is trumped by other things. Um, because obviously Copycat is good against more than just Reshizard, and Frost Rotom is basically just here for Reshizard. It's also reasonable against Picaron, but you're already playing Lavatar, so... Uh, he plays Ditto to be a fifth uh, coughing, uh, plays his own Mew, and plays Let Loose in addition to all these Jirachis. Um, it's really interesting to see the Jirachi-based build, to be honest. I think it's not my favorite build, um, because you've become weak in Mirror, um, and that's something that's relevant right now. And also, I mean, you're committing a lot of spaces. Like, these ropes, boards, um, these are taking up a lot of spaces, which could just be like Poker Gears and stuff. So I'm not so sold on the Jirachi build personally, uh, overall. But playing the Double Guzma, playing for Nest, for Treasure. No Ultra Ball makes me also very sketchy. Um, so just Treasures to find your Weezings. You just have to try and dig them out with Jirachis, I guess. Uh, playing the Adventure Bag for Spell Tag on board makes some sense. Three Shrine is fine. And nine Energy Cards. I think overall, the Jirachi build probably isn't going to be the most popular. Obviously, Jirachi is a very, very strong card, 
Um, and you effectively have five good leads because Coco is also a good out. But I'm surprised we're not seeing two Tapu Cocos in the list. Very surprised we don't see a, a Psychic Transfer or Fairy Transfer type card. And honestly, I think I prefer the Poker Gear based build than Jirachi and committing to all these switching options. That's just my own opinion. But yeah, pretty nice wheezing list to kick things off. From there, we see Kasaraga, um, previous world champion, playing uh, Zapdos. A few other things. Lots of Weezing did very well in Sao Paulo. I think uh, Weezing was smuttered across the uh, top 32 that we're seeing here. A few other Reshizards. A lot of other Zoroark based builds as well. And a good amount of Zapdos. So these are things to bear in mind. Um, the highest placing mill was 11th with Andre Porto playing uh, Lucario Mammetal with Hooper. Also playing Magikarp and Wellord and Buzzmosa. So just lots of chunky Pokemon. Had the Girafferig, the Solvaleo. Obviously, it's like a 190 hit point basic, which is really annoying to get through. Uh, not too much else to really say here. He has the Beast Energy for potential like Beast Game GX play, uh, plays if they have to, which is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, uh, we kind of know what Stall's all about at this point. Playing the Power Plant in there as well. Um, but yeah, there's one Ultra Mali. A good amount of Charizard. Actually, not a huge amount of Charizard. Just three Charizards in the top 32, was it? Or four? Yeah, there was four, right? Because there was two in top eight. So two in top eight. And then one, two more in uh, in day two. So not a huge huge amount of people playing Reshizard in the first place. Or uh, not a lot of them converting, I guess. Uh, more Weezing in day two, really. Uh, also one Quagnag. This is obviously a hyped archetype to be like a counter deck. We see a Picarom also made it. A couple of Picaroms made it as well. So uh, Picaroms not necessarily like dying or anything, but they weren't really high placing lists. Um, but those are things that you can look into a little bit more. Obviously, I'm mostly focusing on the top eight, but trying to give you a, bit, a good picture of what was in the top uh, 32 because it looks like Weezing made one top eight, but also multiple top 32 placements. Reshizard made multiple top 32 placements. Zoro still made top like plenty of top 32 placements. There was Dugong base build. There was Just Sloking. Persian Sloking seems to be one of the more popular ones as well. So stuff to bear in mind. Let's move on to Santa Clara. 470 masters here. And it was won by Keanu Mini, a very established player who's been playing for a long, long time at this point. Um, and consistently done well, usually uh, in uh, day two contention um, in the US. He's playing the four Baby Volk base build. Trying to really give yourself a good Zapdos matchup by having an annoying 120 hit point Pokemon that can use High Heat Blast to knock out opposing Zapdos' turn by turn. Flare Starter is additionally this nice safeguard option where you don't have to use a Welder or Kiawe on turn one. You can use a Draw Supporter instead and end your turn on a Flare Starter to power up a Pokemon, which is pretty cool. We see him with a very simplistic list once again. He's playing two Reshizards and one Eevee and Snorlax. I gotta love the Eevee and Snorlax, I think it's really good. I played it in my um, Jirachi based build of um, Reshizard that you saw just a few days ago, like a week ago, I guess. And Dump Truck Press just literally dumpsters Zoroark that isn't playing Fighting Tax anymore, so you can just run right over the opponent's board with Eevee and Snorlax, which is excellent. I think we'll definitely see that starting to get incorporated with Reshizard uh, because there are seemingly a lot of Zoroark builds just playing blue stuff and completely removing the Fighting type, uh, type stuff. Um, so Keon showing the power of Green's Exploration for the first time. Um, we see also a couple of copies of Kakui added into the list. This is a nice mirror card that you can have. Uh, obviously Reshizard can knock out a clean um, Reshizard with Flare Strike if you have Choice Band Kakui. So that's a pretty cool option to have in the deck. Also playing an Acerola, a Judge. Lieutenant Surge's strategy is a really interesting one. It means that he can go for like Green's, he can go like Surge, Green's to find Welder and then Welder which is pretty cool. You can like greens for uh, Fire Flint Welder or uh, Fire Crystal Welder. These are all pretty cool combos. Um, he's making the most of greens with custom catchers as well. This means he can just gust things out alongside his two Guzmas. He can try and accumulate custom catchers on turns where he's using Welder, which is a very cool option. Also, custom catchers help you out against Let Loose. Of course, one of the sort of worries about a greens based deck is that you just get Let Loose into nothing and having the custom catchers gives you some pseudo defense against that, which is pretty nice, as well as the four Poker Gears. Playing four Nest Ball, three, uh, three Fire Crystal, two Fiery Flint, which is still a really big guard, uh, card to make your Welders live. Playing the Blower, the Max Potion, I really like in here as well. So a nice couple of healing uh, options here. Because you can just simply like reload a new attacker after you do like an Acerola or a Max Potion play, it can be really nice. 
playing on Stealthy Hood as his answer to get through Vileplume. Um, obviously, he has non-GX Volcanion to get through the likes of um, Hoopers eventually. So, obviously, they can't one-shot them, so it's not, like, all that great. But it's a reasonable option to have. You have, like, a number of non-GX attackers. Um, so, yeah, the Stealthy Hood coming in to help out against uh, Plume. Also helps out against... Uh, what do you call it? Wheezing as well. Stop them detention gassing like at least one of your Pokemon in play, which is pretty reasonable. Playing a couple copies of Power Plant, making life very, very difficult for Zoroark players by the looks of things. Also really annoying for some Picaron players because they can't get Zera Aura activation. Um, so this is a really nice Disruption Stadium card that we're starting to see. Get some value here. I think he's Keon's really trying to beat Zoroark pretty hard by playing Power Plant. As well, two power plant as well as the EV Snorlax. I think he should have a very favored Zoroark, which is a really nice thing going into this tournament. I'm again thinking that Field Blower may end up becoming a two count in the format. I really think it's just solid at a two count at the moment. The amount of stuff you're hitting with the Field Blower is huge. So I might see myself flip flopping the power plant and uh, Field Blower counts. Like that's basically all I want to change from his list, which is pretty nice. 11 fire, a little bit on the lower side to normal, but he is counterbalancing that with three uh, fire crystals. So. Yeah, pretty good list from Kian there, showing the power of the baby Volk list. Shemansky uh, ended up coming second. He basically said that he had a teched out version of Pablo's, and that's definitely the case. Um, because he's playing a 1-1 Arcanine as a nice answer, again, to Vileplume, uh, which uh, Pablo didn't play. Um, and uh, this is also a chunky non-GX for Zapdos players to deal with. Also playing Shining Lugia and Turtonator, so lots of non-GXs that he can throw in the face of opposing non-GX variants. Just a couple copies of Jirachi is a little bit sketchy, like you always want to start your Jirachi if possible, but it's still a nice card like in the mid-game to get yourself drawing cards and pick out some key pieces. A couple of Let Loose, the Lele, the Dedene, and the Mew, obviously becoming like more and more staples in Reshizard. Playing the three copies of Kiawe as well as Full Welder. I don't mind dropping the Kiawe count at all, it would be the first thing that I look to really cut from Pablo's list, I guess. Uh, Acrobikes, Ultra Balls, 4 Switch, 3 Fire Crystal, a couple of Nest Balls, a uh, couple Choice Band, all the reasonable stuff there. Like I say, it's a very similar shell to Pablo's list. Uh, Alex will admit that himself, uh, but he just kind of teched for more things that he was expecting. Some more fringe decks that he was able to take W's against because of some of these tech cards. So they've served him well, and they might be more and more relevant if you are expecting the likes of Vileplume and more Zapdos in the format. And obviously Zapdos did pretty well in Sao Paulo. It made... Um, a top eight placement and a you know a couple very close to top eight so and now you'll see Zapdos doing even better in this tournament where two made top four Michael Catron with a Zap Beasts list it seems like a lot of the Zapdos builds have ended up cutting Zeb Striker um, Zeb Striker obviously very relevant to helping you beat Zoroark players but I guess Zoroark is becoming slightly less popular I would imagine obviously it did pretty well in Sao Paulo um, but even then like they're sort of moving towards other focuses, like having a thick Persian line, a thick uh, Sloking line. It's not necessarily that easy for them to get early, like, muck ditto down, maybe so much as it was in the team-up meta. So it seems like a lot of people have just cut the, um, the whatchamacallums, the, <laughs> the zebras from the list to add in more sort of tech Pokemon. I think you can see the counterbalance to beat Zoroark is with this Marshall and Machamp tag team GX. Also, obviously, a very good card at dealing with um, Pika Roms as well, so... Revenge is a huge option to knock out either Picarom or Zoro. You can use a Dance of the Ancients plus manual attachment to Revenge. Then you can attach another energy and go for 100 blows impact as well. So that's absolutely nuts. The Martial Lima Champs are a really interesting tag team that you see incorporated into this list. Um, it's not playing all the Ultra Beasts. It's just playing the Boswell and the Machamp. That's because they play Fighting Energy cards as well as Viridian. Um, down here, a couple copies of Viridian. So uh, they're using that to their fullest extent to get things rolling. Uh, playing the Tapu Coco Prism Star and the Coco GX, still very relevant for dealing with Reshizard as well as Picarom. Um, and from there, just simple stuff, the Let Loose, the Mew, again, Picarom, good for, well, it's reasonable for Weezing, um, not always great. Like, it, you can put the Mew down on turns where you're not prop, uh, popping a spell tag and you can get some value, but it's still a little bit weak in that matchup. Uh, from there, pretty routine support account, playing Kikui over um, Volkner is pretty interesting. There may be some cute maths that I'm not really noticing, but there'll be something there. There'll definitely be a reason for the Kikui. Uh, other than that, playing a very simple shell, three rope and three switch, as well as two board. That's like a very, very high switching counts, which is pretty cool. 
uh, double stretcher, double band, the stealthy hood coming in, it means that you can still Stellar Wish under Muck, and it means that you can also use uh, Tapu Koko to dance under Muck, which is pretty nice to get your Marshadow of a Champ rolling, so it's a pretty cute combo. When you only play one copy though, and you don't play Volkner, it makes me a little bit sketchy. Like, I would, be I would definitely be more comfortable playing one Stealthy Hood if we played Volkner. Obviously, the Stealthy Hood also protects you against Weezing, so it's a card that's seeing more and more play, and just it just so happens that there's like enough cards uh that he's covering that he's worth like it's just a card that can help you out against plume which this deck otherwise doesn't have help you out, help, helps you out against wheezing which is one of your more difficult matchups helps you out against muck as well so it seems to be covering enough bases to be worthwhile in a lot of decks which is pretty interesting the two viridian the one thunder mountain and then a very low count of energies really five and three is one of the lowest i've ever seen for zapdos it's normally six and three um but yeah uh, they got away with one so pretty nice then we see mike morton also playing zapdos uh his list is more rainbow based the more sort of typical list that we've come to expect uh playing the buzzwell nihiligo still playing marsh machamp so that definitely seems to have pulled its weights really doing a lot of work in the opening weeks here um while there's still picarom and zoro roaming about quite a lot this list is playing the heavy Vulcan account and playing no Cynthia's whatsoever, which is interesting in its own right. Normally you see four Lily, two Cynthia, one Volkner. That's like the most standard line. Uh, and then we've seen two lists in top four, one playing no Cynthia and... Sorry, yeah, one playing no Cynthia and three Volkner, and then one just cutting the Volkner all together and just playing two Cynthia. So still seems to be some debate uh, between those, it looks like. Uh, but playing, again, the standard switching cards, uh, the Lotto being added into the deck over just the physical energy... It's something that I think the Limitless guys originally did, and it seems to be nice for grabbing the key pieces at the right time. So obviously you can Volkner for Lotto to try and dig for uh, the special energies on, like, Buzz turn or Nihiligo turn and whatnot, which is cool. Obviously you can Stellar Wish for it as well. Um, the Field Blur being added into this deck, that really tells you how much more relevant Field Blur is in the format now. If Zapdos is making space for Blower, you know it's a relevant card. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't mind it in the deck at all, to be honest. It seems pretty reasonable. Also, a Stealthy Hood coming into um, this list as well. Uh, just Shrine of Punishment being added to the deck. No um, no Thunder Mountain, just a couple Shrines. But again, pretty reasonable. Shrine's still just a great card. Jimmy and Azul uh, both played Shedinja Control. Then both made uh, top eight with a deck. Um, the idea of this archetype, if you're not like certain where their win condition comes from... It's by just running your opponent out of ways to take a knockout for a prize card. So your opponent can knock you out, sure, but you're going to have Vessel of Life to stop them taking a prize card. And the idea is you set up as many Zeb Striker as you can to sprint your deck entirely down to basically zero. And you are all about looping resource management to get back ways to resource management for next turn, as well as setting up another Shedinja for your active. So that's pretty much what you do. You... Um, run your opponent out of Guzmas, or your opponent uses enough Guzmas where they take, let's say in a worst case scenario, they take four prize cards with Guzma, then they're out of Guzmas. And even if they play escape ropes, the idea is that you have one Shedinja on the back, one Shedinja on your front active Pokemon, and then every turn you're using a Ranguru to get yourself back an energy card, a Guru, and a way to Shedinja, and a way to Ninkada. Basically, that's the idea. You can do that every time by resource managementing back in things like Brock's Grit, and a few other pieces here and there. So the idea is you essentially loop Grit and then sprint from Grit to get your Monkey Energy Shedinja Ninkada. That's pretty much the loop that you go for with this deck and you run them out of stuff. You'll see there is a cute double Trumbeak plus Hiker combination in here. It's an additional way that you can try and Grinch your opponent out of Guzmas. So uh, if ever you can just hit a Guzma from a Trumbeak, you're super, super happy and Hiker helps you get towards that combo. Because essentially the opponent can always gust stuff and then you end up, um, like, if they have enough gusts to get around Shedinja, you'll lose. And because there are more people playing an amount of Field Blower, you probably want to hike her away like one Guzma so you don't just lose, right? And I think this is another reason why we'll start seeing Blower at a two count, uh, just to deal with this deck. Because otherwise it's very difficult for decks to just handle. Um, especially, like, Reshizard's probably playing three Guzma more than four a lot of the time. They play, like, one Blower at the moment so you can see how they lose to the Shedinja deck quite a good amount of times uh but here 
Um, if you add in a second blower, things are going to get rough for this archetype. So I think it's, this is like a medical cool deck. Like it was really cool and got them very far in the tournament, but it feels like now the secret's out. Like obviously this archetype was played in a different rendition in the EUIC by Pedro and a few other um, European players. Uh, but now the secret's kind of out. And I think two blower will become more and more staple, I think. Um, playing the Persian here as well for milling archetypes. Um, so you can get rid of like their Lusamine loop, which is pretty cool. You can get rid of a few other key pieces, which is nice. Playing Mew so that you no longer instantly lose to a Magikarp Werelord Quagsire deck. Um, otherwise, that's an auto loss for this archetype. It means Mew can help out against that. Also, it's pretty good against Picarom, of course, um, because you can stop them just taking one free prize via snipe damage rather than via, um, what's it called, just Goosemaring. Uh, so you improve a couple otherwise very awkward matchups for the deck. Also helps out against Weezing. Of course, we're never popping spell tags with this deck, so you have a lot of time for Mew to cycle. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, also, they play Champions Festival, so you can heal your Mew to have a lot more longevity alongside that. And obviously, you're never letting them use Counter Catcher either. And there's a good amount of Weezing decks that only play Counter Catcher for Gust. And if that's the case, you're going to be absolutely fine. Uh, they play Lily, Ingo, and Emmett. It's like the meme supporter, but still pretty helpful. Because you're literally trying to dump your hand as quickly as possible with this deck. You're literally looking to cycle your deck as quickly as possible. And Ingo and Emmett is like the fake version of um, Sycamore. So I guess it makes sense. Lieutenant Surge lets you do some funky combos. Lets you like dig with... Uh, you, you can like Surge, Brock, and do any of these combinations... Um, to like dig for a turn or do extra disruption and then you can obviously Oranguru surge back in for some crazy turns really. Um, Hiker, like I said, helps you Grinch more supporters from the opponent, mainly uh, Guzma. Faber to get rid of opposing special energy cards like on Weezings and whatnot, that can be pretty nice. And against like Zoro Control, I guess. Um, so they can't just like infinitely loop their own um, field blowers and uh, like DCs to attack you, Zoro being your hardest matchup if they are playing Monkey, I would say. Uh, playing Mars, again, to try and Grinch some stuff from the opponent's hand and getting a minor amount of digging. Because um, at the end of the day, you're trying to do this Orangaroo loop so that you deck your opponent out. That's the that's the whole concept here. Um, Tate and Liza for additional switching. Um, and uh, Gladian. you got the bikes, Nest Ball, Ultra Ball, Great Ball. You can see how simplistic this deck is. You're just... Like, these uh, 16 cards tells you what the deck's all about. Just find your board, and then you just start galloping and trying to dig deep so that you have no deck, so you can resource management and then sprint into exactly what you want. That's the whole idea. A poker gear. Obviously, they're playing a lot of different supporter cards, so that's very versatile. Stretcher, Power Pad, and Champions Festival. I think it's a really smart call to play the festival to play around the spreading archetypes, which would otherwise be a huge pain. And again, like, you'll always win the Stadium War when you have a Rangaroo to recover it. So, yeah, pretty cool build for sure, with the three fires being your only energy cards that you require. They play fire energies because you can take advantage of opposing players' um, heat factories. That's the reason why you pick fires over any other energy card. Previously, you played water energies because you would play the Memory Melt Slow King. That's since been cut by the looks of things to add in the Trumbeak Hiker package rather than Memory Melt, which... It's pretty reasonable, to be honest. Um, I think the problem with the Memory Melt package was you're a little bit reliant on... Um, like, you end up benching things that aren't Blitzels, which gets worrying for you, because you already need to be benching Ninkardas and Blitzels. So if you're benching, like, a Slowpoke, or if your Ditto is like can't become a Slow King, life gets awkward for you. So I can see why they went for the Hiker package over the Slow King package. I think the Fire Energy is a really good call because you can take advantage of people's heat factories, and that's just even more draw for you. So, really, really cool deck. Uh, Azul and Jimmy piling it, piloting it to a very high finish. Also, you can see uh, Adrian and uh, maybe a couple others playing this archetype as well. Uh, it's a very high placements. Looks like some Zora controls in there as well. Um, so, yeah, these guys got far with a very awkward archetype, and you got to play some more field blowers, guys, if you want to get rid of these <laughs> these uh, stupid shit ninja decks. Preston Ellis was the highest placing um, sort of stalling milling archetype. We can't see his list, but Lucario Melmetal and Vileplume seems to be the way he's gone about it. Vileplume can get around a lot of different guys. It's only a number of people playing Stealthy Hoods in the first place. And then like if Stall just adds in Fabber or Field Blower, they can eventually just still win out the resource war if they get out multiple Vileplumes, which is cool. Marcus Dodson made top eight with Picarom. And this is an archetype that seems to be sort of like it's obviously less popular than it was in Team Up. Uh, seemed to be one of the best decks in Team Up, but now it seems to be kept in check by Reshiram Charizard a lot, as well as a few other things here and there. But it still has done very, very well. 
Um, he's playing a combination of like the new electromagnetic radar Dedene package, but also ke keeps a couple Jirachis to help you Stellowish throughout the mid game, which is nice. I think that's pretty cool. Also keeping a couple of Zapdos for early like cheap prizes is always great. Playing a high judge count um, instead of playing any Marsh... Well, it plays one Marshmallow and two judge, which is pretty interesting. You rarely see that in the deck, to be honest. Uh, but it's playing the maximum copies of E-Switch. Uh, it's playing the Field Blur. Again, this card, like, Field Blur is just back. I think there's no argument about that. Blower is just, like, back in a big way. And I think it's a really strong card right now. A uh, couple Band, Viridian, Thunder Mountain. Seems like a really nice build of Picaron, to be honest. It's simplistic. It's added in to Dene and Electromagnetic Radar, which is, like, the two most important cards for the deck uh, from the new set. So everything seems to be very reasonable with Picaron here. Pretty nice uh, build overall. Uh, Jose, unfortunately, came in ninth, but he was playing Reshi Reshizard. He was playing it with Volk and Jirachi by the looks of things. Actually, it seems to be like a hybrid, playing like a small amount of Jirachi, but also has like... Yeah, maybe it's... Yeah, it's like a hybrid. Having a couple Volks and also a couple Jirachi gives him the option to do both, which is pretty interesting. He's playing Double Blower. I'm a big fan of that. Jose is um, on top of the meta with a Double uh, Field Blower early on in the game. That's really nice from him. Uh, what else have we got? Let's have a little sort of overview of Santa Clara. A lot of mill. A lot, a lot of mill. Milled in pretty well. Um, as you can see, like, what's this? Six, seven, like seven or eight uh, made day two in Santa Clara, which is pretty gross, to be honest. Uh, there's still a good amount of Zapdos everywhere. Uh, there was some wheezings. Is this the highest place wheezing? The highest place wheezing was at 18th. Carter, and we can't see his list just yet. Highest place in Quagnag was 17th. Quagnag is an interesting archetype because it's got a really good Reshizard and Mill. And Mill seems to be pretty relevant right now. Uh, so it seems to be an archetype that's still well placed but just has the consistency issues that uh, we still can't really get around. <laughs> Even with Pokegears being added into the deck, which pretty much every Quagnag player has done now, you still have those consistency issues which are rough. And Magi Whale isn't just a late game win condition against a lot of decks adding in Mew. So do bear that in mind. You're... Maybe maybe your Zapdos matchup isn't as strong as it used to be, so something to bear in mind. But uh, we see Weezing not doing quite as well in Santa Clara as it did in Sao Paulo, but still played to a couple high finishes. Uh, lots of Reshizard. We see a non-GX Blounds. This is the first non-GX Blounds we've seen. Um, Roberto, he's playing the Jirachi build with uh, Victini in here as well. Um, so it's a build that I profiled just yesterday, I think. So if you want to check out my baby Blounds, you can definitely do that, but Roberto's list looks very similar. Similar to Azul's post, actually. Uh, more Reshizard's doing well. We start to see a couple of Malamar, but Malamar seems to be dropping off the map entirely compared to all this other stuff. Um, it just doesn't seem to have the legs. Uh, Alfredo Garcia, uh, Garcia played uh, the Vika Vault deck. I was really surprised to see this list. Uh, surprised for a couple of reasons. First of all, he's playing Jirachi Engine, uh, whereas previously I've only ever played it with Meganium. Uh, so he's basically saying that if my four Vika Volts die, I've lost the game. And he only plays four Candy and plays no Gladian. And that scares me a lot. Uh, so I want to make changes to this list for sure. Uh, because if you prize any Charger Bug or Rare Candy, or even like the tech one-offs like Coco and Mew and stuff, you can just lose the game off of that. So playing no Gladian at the very least scares me a huge amount when essentially you can only attack with your... Um, Vika Volts here. Like, if all your Vika Volts are dead, like, you're left doing, like, static shock for 50 and stuff. So, um, pretty interesting to see the Vika Volt deck do so well. But I definitely think there's changes to be made from this list. But it's insane that we see it making uh, top 32. Um, it's a sort of, like, meme rogue archetype that I enjoyed playing, um, but sort of wrote off. And we're seeing it do reasonably well. And there's work to be done with the list. Like, it can be improved. So, who knows? Maybe it's real. Um, more Weezings, another Quagnag doing okay, and that sort of rounds things off. We do see a couple Zoro controls and a Zoro dose towards the end, so uh, it seems like Zoroark was just not doing well. Uh, Zoro uh, Persian Slow King uh, by Finnegan Lynch um, is the highest placing Zoro variant, but it looks like they all kind of fell towards day two, like they all stayed low. Um, so they seem to be in a bad spot. The Zoro Control is interestingly doing pretty well out of all the other Zoro builds. So definitely something to bear in mind. 
And then we'll finally look at Sydney, 148 Masters, so not the largest event. We only have the top eight to look at, but it was won by Zapdos. Again, it looks like uh, the Zeb Striker is being cut. At least in this build, it's cut down to a 1-1. So you still have that minor option against Zoro players, uh, but adding in space for more Ultra Beasts. Kartana is probably the most questionable Ultra Beast. I personally don't play it in my latest list, but it's in um, the winning list, as well as the Buzz Mosa being played. Uh, so we saw two, the top four lists of Santa Clara playing a Marshall and a Champ, and now we're seeing the Buzz Mosa being added. The entire reason why you play the Buzz Mosa is that you can beast game GX and take an extra prize to knock something out. So if you're behind on a prize race, which is rare for Zapdos in the first instance, but like if you're in Mirror, you can like beast game with a beast energy to knock out a Jirachi and like win the prize race at the end game. That's the whole idea of this uh, this one card in the deck. Um, from there, again, no Volkner, just a 4-4-2. Again, you have to make spaces for these extra Ultra Beasts by the looks of things. Uh, two Scratcher, two Shrine, uh, sorry, two Choice Band and three Shrines. So very, very high anti-GX uh, cards in this list by the looks of things with four Lightning, four Rainbow, one Beast. So um, yeah, very anti-GX based build with no, no like Stealthy Hood or Field Blower or anything of the sort at the moment. No real answers to Weezing, no real answers to like um, Vileplume outside of going for Head Bolt over and over again. <laughs> That's like all you have. So, pretty interesting stuff. Henry Brandt playing a Zoro Persian, got second. Um, I think he made a post on Facebook that you can read about what he thought about his list. He had the 1-1 one, one Dugong, the 1-1 one, one Sloking, and a 2-1 Persian line, as well as 1-1 one, one Muck. It makes me very scared when you play so many, like, thin lines of cards. It definitely makes me a little nervous. Um, but he's tried to jam in as much as he can here. Got the uh, new reset hole Marshadow as well, popping up, as well as the Mew. The Dene being added into the deck to help you just Dene change to have better like turn one or twos, which is reasonable. I like the Brooklyn Hill Stadium choice, and I really like the two blower. Again, I think two blowers becoming more and more of a thing. Uh, it's like my biggest takeaway, I would say, from like week one of Unbroken Bonds is that double blower seems super clutch. If you want to beat out Weezings, if you want to beat out uh, Shedinja decks, if you want to um, help out against Blounds and Quagnag, like Blow is just so nuts for them. So I think that's definitely something to bear in mind. Um, three Choice Band and the one Kikui to help math fixing with like Sloking and Dugong and stuff like that, even with Persian to an extent um, for like Vengeance and Slashback later on in the game. So stuff to bear in mind. And then just the eight energy cards. I think it's pretty interesting. But once you see two Rescue Stretcher being thrown into a Zoroark deck, I guess with the very thin lines of Pokemon, that's his sort of counterbalance, I guess you could call it. Um, but yeah, pretty interesting Zoro like toolbox style deck making second place. Another Zapdos in top four, as well as a Reshizard. So Reshizard's made at least top four in all three of these regionals, getting a win, a win, and then a top four here. So it's definitely an archetype that's going to stick around. And we are seeing a Volcanian Greens build again do very, very well. So potentially this is even stronger than the uh, than the Jirachi builds that many people have been tending towards. Um, this list has an answer to um, the good old Vileplume in Flareon, which is really nice. Uh, also, Heat Stage is like a fourth Volcanian in many respects uh, because it can do the similar things if you just happen to start the Eevee or whatnot. Bright Flame being enough to knock out a lot of things with Choice Band help as well, so good things to bear in mind. Also with Kukui's playing the EV Snorlax to help you get through Zoros a lot of the time, and also playing the late game Infinity GX option to be another non-GX that can also give you some reload, really go against Mill again, so that you just don't run out of stuff. Um, interestingly, incorporating the Lieutenant Surge as well in this build, both Kian and uh, whoever this was, I forget... David, they're both playing the uh, Lieutenant Surge as a one-of in the deck, which is really interesting to see, to be honest. I didn't really assume it to go into a deck like this, but I guess the idea is you're going to do like a Volcanian and they're going to smack into the Volk or whatever. Then you'd be like, cool, I'll just Surge and do whatever I want. Uh, you've got the four Gears, the four Flints, just a very simplistic list. Only one Fire Crystal, but that kind of makes sense because you've got the Victini Reload instead. One Battle's a pretty crazy uh, choice, but that helps you just... Like, if you put that on a Reshizar that takes two prizes or whatever, and then you're like, cool, I have this bat on. Can you take a knock... Like, can you, like, dig for a knockout on, and also Field Blower me? I think this is probably going to end up getting cut because the amount of Field Blower that will be incorporated into the format. But early weeks, I think you get huge value out of the card. And three Power Plant. So both Kian playing two, and now we see David playing three Power Plant. 
they're really out for blood against Zoro. And uh, yeah, I think they did the job very, very well. Uh, these decks should have pretty good odds against Zoro. And even like you just establish the, like you have your turn and then you just drop the power plant and then people can't Lele for um, Kia, like their own welders or Kiawe's and they can't find like Lilies. Uh, people can't Dede change and have powerful turns against you. So it's harder for decks to basically like do what they want to do on turn one, which is good when you're committing like four energy or three energy to a Rechizard on turn one and not really attacking. Um, so like you're stopping people finding their Pokemon, their energy, their Guzma and stuff like that because of power plants. So it's a nice disruptive option here. And then 13 fire. Um, then we have Christian Hasbani, very uh, established Australian player playing Zap. Um, looks like he's also Zap Beast. Everyone seems to be cutting the Zebra by the looks of things. The 1-1 one, one Buzz Nihiligo. No new Pokemon in the deck at all. No Spiritomb, no um, tag team Pokemon whatsoever. So just the same simple shell um, that we've always seen of Zap, but adds in the Mew as the option to defend against some spread stuff. Um, playing, again, no Volkner, just the 4-4-3. Four, four, Playing the three Viridian, that's a really high count. But he plays, instead of uh, Rainbow Energies, he plays one Fighting, one Psychic. Uh, I think he said in his post that um, he really wanted to play Viridians because he was so sick and tired of missing his Rainbow Energies. And again, when you don't play Zeb Striker, you have like no searchability for those energies outside of like Energy Lotto and like Volkner and stuff. So um, I can definitely foresee the reason why he had such a high Viridian count. Cutting uh, the... Shrines is pretty bold, but it kind of worked out for him. Then we see a Picarom also making top eight, which is pretty interesting. We'll have one final look at a list here. Playing a couple Raikus. Oh, this man's out for blood. He wants to have an answer to Zapdos. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I played Raikou in uh, my last regional. Busted card against Zapdos. Uh, playing Zeraora, Coco, Coco, Dedene, Lele. Playing the Ray. And one Marshall as well. So very Turbo Rom based, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, playing the full E-Switch. The Treasures, the double multi-switch. So yeah, this is this is like Turbo Peak Rom, if ever I've seen it. And again, one cheeky Radar as well. Why not? And uh, yeah, pretty nice build. If you want to play Turbo, that's one way to go about it. That's like a real, that's like a Japanese list of Peak Rom, like way back when, by the looks of things. Uh, then we see, to round out the top eight, Another Zapdos. So we saw four Zoroarks in the top eight of Sao Paulo. And then in Sydney, we see four Zapdos in top eight. Pretty interesting. They're definitely seeming to still remain relevant in the format. Uh, with lots of Reshizard ending up like at the very top of the of the pile. A couple in top eight for both Santa Clara and Sao Paulo. And then one in top eight of Sydney. So it seems pretty rep representative that those are like the top three decks fighting out amongst one another right now. Um, with a few others like wheezing and stall and stuff like that sort of poking its head in and trying to still be relevant. Obviously, Picarom still being a relevant archetype as well with a few new tricks up its sleeve. But that seems to be the main picture here. And just to drive that home, you get to see um, the points earned from, uh, from all three of these decks collated together. And I have separated it into different variants. Um, so Reshizard and um, Reshizard with Volcanion have been split here. But they still fall underneath Zapdos overall being the most prevalent deck from these three regionals that we've seen so far. Then it's the Reshiram stuff. Weezing spread being the third highest uh, accumulated points by the looks of things. Uh, Lucario with Vileplume also doing very well. And we start seeing Shedinja Control and the Zoroark decks. Again, this is one of those things where the Zoroark decks aren't all bunched together. So you'll see there's like 45, 36, 18 and 15 down here. I think all of these bunch together, if I was to take away the split here, you'll see that they are actually third above the Weezing. So that's something to bear in mind. Wall stall, this is like the Vileplume and the Hooper builds all together. And then you see Malamar doing very, very poorly. That That's like, you know, one Ultra and one uh, Tina Mali, and then like maybe like one or two others. Like two Ultras and a Tina Mali, I think that's basically like it. Uh, Picarom, you're doing reasonably okay. Quagnag. Baby Blounds and the, like, Baby Blounds and V-Clock Charge Bug, that's, like, one placement each in top 32 by the looks of things. So, you go back to the split here, you'll see um, that the Picarom still incorporating Jirachi and Zapdo seems to be the better build of the two that we've seen so far. But, yeah, really interesting stuff from the first week of Unbroken Bonds. 
Um, we have some upcoming tournaments. Let me uh, uh, let me quickly have a look at this. We have Madison coming at the start of June. Then we have also the regional in Sweden. Uh, I'm not going to try pronouncing that because I'll probably butcher it. But that's in the middle of the month. And then one week after that, we will have the biggest tournament of the year. The internationals for the NAIC in Columbus, which will be very exciting um, to get a look at. I'm actually not attending anymore. I fell short of the mark in Bristol of making points. So I'm too far out of the top 22 race to really justify going to this regional or this international. So I'm just going to chill until the world championships. Uh, I'm going to have to slog through day one all over again, which is always a huge headache. But uh, we'll try that and see how it goes. But let me know what you guys think about the start of the Unbroken Bonds format. What do you think are going to be the best decks going forward? How will you be adapting some of these top lists? What's your favorite list? Who are you rooting for in all of these tournaments? I'll hear it all down below. And also tell me what's the best play for the next two regionals and what's the play for NAIC because it's going to creep up on us, man. We're exactly one month away today. And that means that people are going to start getting their decks ready and prepared uh, because it's going to come up quick. So let me know down below, guys. Hope you enjoy this video discussing the meta as we know it now from the early Unbroken Bonds and how it's going to progress as well. Uh, it'll all be very interesting stuff. So thanks for watching and I'll be back tomorrow with another video. Cheers.